We're going to get started. Yep. Thank you so much for coming out this morning on another snowy day in Minnesota. Um, hopefully the Saturday works well for people. And if you have any feedback on that, of course, we would love to hear that. Um, so I'll just start quickly by introducing myself. So I'm Council Member Jenna Carter. Uh, I am an at-large member. I was elected in November of 2019. So I started on my term on January 2020. I think everybody in this room knows what happened a couple months after that. So it's been quite a wild ride in my first term here in council. Uh, and then my term will be up at the end of 2023. So, oh, actually, I, I do want to mention too that I live here in Bloomington with my husband, Mike, who actually joined us today. Thank you. Um, and then we have two kids. We have a son who's 12 and goes to Oak Grove. And then we have a daughter who is eight and goes to Hillcrest. And then we have two dogs, Luna and Sunny. Can't forget about our fur babies. Yes. So, so uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Sa Mua. Um, it's pronounced Sa like a chainsaw. That's kind of how you can remember it. So uh, I am the other at-large council member. And I was recently appointed in February when um, former council member Nathan Coulter uh, vacated the seat to take his, uh, his seat at the state house. So I'm very excited and very honored to be working with all of you in the city to uh, continue making sure that Bloomington's a remarkable community. Um, I, I'll tell you a funny story here. Uh, I joke with my wife all the time and she's like, we have a baby coming in April, we have two toddlers, so why are you doing city council on top of that? So anyways, it's very busy, but I'm excited for it. Uh, and I'll, I'll share also, literally the morning after uh, the vote from city council, uh, I went out and I was driving around town just to get a new view, right? And I was looking at the houses and the businesses and the parks and the schools around. All of a sudden I felt this weight just settle on my shoulders. <laughs> and it was a big weight. And uh, I've been entrusted to help lead Bloomington in the future. And it's a role that I'm very excited about, but also a role that I take very seriously. So um, thank you so much for being here today. We're excited to have this discussion with everyone. Um, as you can tell, we are very fortunate that Saw decided to put his name forward for the appointment. So thank you. Um, so just a couple of logistical pieces. Um, Chief Seal is going to be pulling the questions out of a bowl. So if you have some that you haven't yet written down, there are cards and pens in the back of the room and you can just bring them up here and we can add them. Uh, some of the town halls have been more conversational, but one thing that we did notice when they're a little bit bigger, um, it can be unfair for people who have submitted their questions via the bowl um, if there's a lot of back and forth with one or two people in the crowd and we might run out of time. And so just in fairness to everybody who showed up this morning and who has questions, we wanna make sure we can get through as many of those as possible. So we are gonna go through the presentation first and then we will take questions at the end. Um, and with that, I think that we'll go to the next slide here. So this is the uh, outlay of how our districts are split up. So hopefully everyone here knows what district you live in and who is your direct district council member. Um, council member Carter and I, we are the at-large. So we take a large view of the city. So we don't own a specific district, but we try to take the view from the city as a whole. And so if you don't know who your council member is in your district, please let us know so we can help you figure out who that is. But also know that you can uh, reach out to Council Member Carter and I anytime uh, regarding any issues that you might have, whether it's related to your specific neighborhood or the city at, at large. We also have um, this wonderful map of the districts in the back. Would love to have you uh, put a sticker in your district. You don't have to put it on your house. We don't need to know where you live, but uh, in your district so that we can kind of see it at large district council member or at large council members, um, are we able to you know, address the, the needs of the, the city as a whole? So please let us know where you live so we can get a feel for who's coming from where. Thank you, Sa. Uh, so the other thing that I wanted to mention, um, so as I mentioned, we're both at large. So we have the two at large members. Each district has an at large. So we're six council members plus the mayor. So a seven member council. I also like to tell people or remind people that we are not like Minneapolis or St. Paul. We are not full time and we are not even part time. I joke we are part, part, part time. So I think a previous council member, Jack Beloga, had calculated it out and he, he figured he made about a dollar an hour. So we do get a stipend, but all of us council members also have full-time jobs. And so throughout the presentation, or at the end of the presentation, I will say, uh, we will do the best we can to answer the questions you have. And if you want more details, if you have a lot more questions, we're happy to sit down and have a conversation. We're happy to do follow-up. Uh, we can have staff reach back out too. So. 
Um, I also just want to pause and recognize that we do have our Hennepin County Commissioner here today, Debbie Gotell, sitting in the back. So thank you, Debbie, for coming. So if you have any Hennepin County questions, you can ask Debbie. And we also have a council member from District 3, Lona D'Alessandro, joining us. Uh, so if you live in District 3 and you have specific District 3 questions, uh, Lona is here this morning as well. Are there any other electives in the room that I'm not seeing? Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so with that, we will move on to our presentation. Yeah, so today we're going to go over a few key topics that have been obviously going on through the city so that we can give uh, you guys a, an update on what's going on. Uh, and then after we get through this presentation, we'll take the questions, whether they're related to this or other topics or whatever it is, we'll uh, continue with that conversation then. Awesome. So the first topic that we're going to touch on is the city's new strategic plan, Bloomington Tomorrow Together. So last year, hundreds of people across the city came together, uh, residents and city staff, to develop the new strategic plan. Uh, the plan that we had in place prior to this one was really developed by the city council with uh, very little engagement of residents, which was a fine approach at that time, but the council now really felt strongly that we needed to have a community-centered, community-gauged approach as we developed new goals for the city. And so, uh, there was a core planning team, which actually Council Member Mua served on, so I don't know if you wanna make any comments about yeah. that experience. Sure, uh, I, I was on the core planning team as a resident, so this was before um, being appointed to, to office, and so I was extremely happy to see that the city was taking this approach, because I think traditionally, across the country, in Minnesota, the strategic plan is done by the city council and staff. And that's a big voice that's not heard is the residents. So uh, we were very intentional in this strategic plan. Lots of conversation over you know, five days, we were stuck in a room together. And so we were very intentional on the wording we chose and the outcomes we wanted to see. So very proud of the work we did. I'm very happy that the city is taking this approach to ensure that residents' voices are being heard as we plan for the future. So in addition to the core planning team, there were action teams. There were a lot of community engagement sessions. I think, I see a lot of people in the room, I think that attended those sessions as well. So thank you for that. Um, and so the result of our strategic planning engagement process led to new core values, a new mission statement, new strategic objectives, and new strategies. Um, and those will guide us over the next five years. All right, so as you can see on the screen up here, our new mission is to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. Uh, so the plan really acknowledges the fact that Bloomington is a unique and special place. We have things that, are, that make us a dynamic community. For example, one of the things I love to tell people about Bloomington is that 35%, 35 to 36% of Bloomington is parkland and green space. Most communities in the metro area are about 15%. So we have really unique assets that make us special uh, that we want to protect and celebrate and continue to build on so that we do have a thriving community where people want to be. Uh, so now the next step is that city staff have been working on a work plan uh, based on the core values, the mission, the strategic objective, and the strategies. And that work plan has three priority areas with desired outcomes. And so that is going to be presented, I believe, on April 4th at the council meeting if you are interested in learning more. I'm gonna provide just a quick overview. So the first priority area in the work plan is fostering a connected and welcoming community. And we are holding ourselves accountable as a council and as a city to really measure our progress and our success in each of these priority areas. Uh, so for this one, it is how connected people feel to their neighbors, how welcome they feel by, to, by the city, and then how valued they feel by the community. And then staff have identified 11 initiatives uh, to measure our progress in this area, one example being implementing our park system master plan. And sorry, I think I said April 4th, but I think, it's, I think April 3rd is a Monday, so April 3rd. Uh, the second priority area is uh, being a healthy community, and so, our measures of success for that priority area will be improved environmental health, improved mental health, and increased safety and security. So staff have identified seven initiatives that are is falling in this priority bucket, one example being implementing our energy action plan. And then the third area is being a community with equitable economic growth. And our measures in this area, obviously, are 
um, that economic growth is more equally distributed, uh, that there is expanded diversity in business ownership, and that there's equitable job growth. So seven initiatives have already been identified by staff. One that we are super excited about in the city is the launch of our new small business development center. Uh, so the city is currently working on a public-facing dashboard that will be launched on our website this summer. So any of you, anybody in our community, can go on our website and see how we are making progress on these priority areas. All right, so getting into the Bloomington sales tax, or uh, throughout the state, it's known as LOST, lo Local Option Sales Tax. And to just do a brief background so people can get their head around this, Local Option Sales Tax has been a tool that cities throughout Minnesota have been able to use that generates revenue outside of our traditional property taxes. Uh, this way, uh, we can uh, get uh, it funds from visitors who come to your city to fund uh, local capital projects that are needed in the community. Um, there is a process with this, so it's not just going to happen. We did submit paperwork to the state legislature this past January to get approval to even put this question on a ballot that then needs to get voted on by Bloomington residents. Uh, so it is a, a multi-step process. Uh, and generally, the local option sales tax is a half a percent tax on the taxable items already being sold in the city. So it's not going to impact the groceries you buy at the grocery store. It's not going to impact the clothing that you're getting that is not taxed. It's going to only impact the services and products that are already taxable. Uh, so at a half percent tax, uh, that allows us to, to generate revenue. And the University of Minnesota um, Extension Services estimated that we'll uh, receive about $12 million a year for the next 20 years uh, if we're able to pass and implement the local option sales tax. We've identified three projects that we have prioritized that this money would then help support. And that's the Bloomington Ice Gardens, the new Community Health and Wellness Center, and then the Nine Mile Creek Watershed um, Restoration. Typically, if this was born solely on taxpayer dollars, uh, these are capital improvements that we have to make to make sure that the city is healthy, that we have the services that residents are looking for. If we did it solely in property tax, the Bloomington property taxpayer would expect to see about $230 a year in additional tax, property taxes to support these projects. With the lost option, the local option sales tax, we are able to utilize this big thing on the east side of the, the city, this big mall shopping area called the Mall of America, and get money from visitors who come to Bloomington and lift the burden off the taxpayers. It's estimated we're gonna have 60% of these projects funded from visitors to Bloomington who are spending their dollars and purchasing things here. And so the rest of the remaining 40% would be then be traditional property tax. And so we would be looking at the uh, typical homeowner, uh, property tax owner, only uh, having to contribute an additional 70 to $100. So it's a huge lift off of our property taxes and allowing visitors who are going to come here, who want to be here, who want to shop here, uh, to help us in complete these capital projects that our residents um, are asking for. All right. Um, the only other thing I would mention on the local option sales tax is if the legislature were to approve Bloomington being able to move forward with local option sales tax, again, um, those questions would be on the ballot in November and you would vote for each project individually. So you wouldn't have to vote for all or none. So if you're supportive of big, but you don't wanna see the nine mile trail improvements, you could just vote yes for big. So just wanna kind of emphasize that. All right, so another hot topic here in Bloomington, the World's Expo. Um, so the United States, uh, the last time the United States hosted a World's Expo was in 1984 in New Orleans. Uh, so it's been quite a while. And when you consider the economic, the political, the diplomatic, the cultural significance of these events, it is actually pretty surprising that we haven't had one. It's also been surprising because for many years now, the United States actually has been interested and has been pursuing uh, the expo. It's been bipartisan. There's been support at the federal level uh, and at the state level. And so, you know, we are pretty excited here on council and at the city because the, the separate organization that is leading these efforts really is making a lot of progress in terms of getting the expo here. Uh, so the theme of the expo this year is, or sorry, 
if it were to come here, the theme of Expo 2027 would be healthy people, healthy planet. Uh, we do believe that Minnesota is one of the perfect places to showcase uh, the forward thinking approaches that are happening in this space. The host country will be decided in June. And if the United States were to win the bid, the expo would happen between May and August of 2027. We are competing against Spain, Thailand, Serbia, and Argentina. So some fierce competitors, I will say. Uh, and then the proposed site is actually in South Loop on two different parcels that equal about 50 acres. So one is currently a parking lot, and it's been a parking lot for as long as I think anybody can remember. And the other parcel has been vacant for about 10 years. So not currently providing a lot of value to the residents of Bloomington. So there are many benefits to uh, the USA hosting a World's Expo, but I really want to focus specifically on the local benefits because that is, of course, what I care about the most. And I think Councilmember Moore would agree with me. Um, Personally, my feeling is that this is a huge opportunity for Bloomington because it is a massive economic development project. Uh, when you look at the size of those parcels and you think about how long it would ordinarily take us to develop them, it would be years, over a decade, sometimes two decades. I mean, if you look around our, our city right now, look at old Chacopee in France, right? It has taken years and years and years to see redevelopment in that area. And so this is kind of a massive infusion of resources in these two parcels that will bring economic development long-term, job growth, and increased tax revenue, not just when the expo is here, but into the future. And as Councilmember our Councilmember Mua talked about a little bit already, you know, when we have that additional tax revenue, whether it's coming from the hotels or South Loop in the Mall of America that offsets our property taxes. And when we talk about wanting to make sure that Bloomington is an affordable place to live, part of that is having a really strong, vibrant economic base to help offset our residential property taxes. Um, so there are additional benefits that are more kind of state and regional. Uh, if you got the last Bloomington briefing, there were some really nice statistics on the front page there. I don't think I'm gonna read through them kind of in the interest of time, um, but uh, I think we have one more slide. Of course, I'm the slide person here. And I will add also, this is getting support not only from just the city, but from the state and the federal level. Um, bipartisan support across the, the federal level to have uh, the World's Fair, the Expo here uh, in Minnesota. So we're getting a lot of support um, to help uh, in promote this event if we do get it, uh, if we do get selected this summer. So I'm uh, very excited that we have this level of support from uh, across the country. Um, two more quick points. Bloomington taxpayers are not on the hook. There are minimal resources going into the Expo project right now from the city of Bloomington. Uh, there is a separate organization that is doing the fundraising. If we were to get the bid, there would be a separate organization that has to do all of the fundraising. Uh, the Bloomington taxpayers are protected. We are treating this as an economic development project. And so just as in, if there were any economic development project, there's always a little bit of risk, but that risk is not being borne by the taxpayers. And if something were to go sideways or, um, and, and there would still be good infrastructure in place that we would work to transform into commercial development or housing, which is what we do all the time, particularly in the South Loop. Uh, and then the last piece that I was going to say about this, uh, something I feel really passionately about and I, I believe that others on council feel really passionately about, is that we have to engage our community in thinking through what this looks like, not just now, but into the future. So we know that it is critically important to not just be thinking about the event itself, but what happens to that infrastructure after the event. There's permanent infrastructure and then there is temporary infrastructure that gets taken down. One of the ideas was, can that temporary infrastructure go to build tiny homes somewhere else, right? Like, there are really cool, innovative, sustainable ways that we can move forward with this project. And my understanding is that if we were to get the bid, the architects and developers would be engaging our community in those conversations. All right. <clears throat> so now the other big topic that's been floating around is the water park at the Mall of America. Uh, this is a really interesting topic. It's, it's something that's been developing for quite a while. Uh, and I will say I'm excited about this opportunity because hospitality in Bloomington 
is our largest industry. It makes up 20% of the city's revenue. So hotels, the mall, bars, restaurants, that all feeds directly into the city and helps lift the tax burden off of our taxpayer base. Uh, I know uh, when, I, when I went to the, uh, the, the League of Minnesota Cities um, new leaders uh, convention, there are cities all across Minnesota who are so jealous that we have this type of opportunity here in Bloomington. It's what we're able to do to help support the region. So things like the Super Bowl, NCAA Final Fours, both men and women, the Ryder Cup, countless other events couldn't happen unless Bloomington had the regional infrastructure, the regional industry to support that. And this goes a long way to continue to make sure that we have a robust hospitality industry. This is going to be privately financed, and so this isn't going to be um, put on the, the back of the taxpayer to support this project. And so I know the mall is having con conversations to fill a uh, financing gap uh, that, they're, uh, that they currently have. What the city will offer is what you might have heard is called tax increment financing, or TIF. Uh, and TIF is a really complicated subject. And Councilmember Carter has a great explanation for that, so I'm going to let her explain <laughs> that. I don't know about great, <laughs> but um, so here, who here knows what TIF is? Okay, so we've got a couple of hands, but there are plenty of hands that are not up. Um, so tax increment financing, very, very simply put, um, is the, so every property has a value, right? And the city gets a property tax based on the value of that property. We have a lot of properties that, um, well, I'll just give an example. Uh, we had a property that was an old kind of dilapidated commercial building in Bloomington, right? Didn't add a lot of value um, to the community, just in general, but then also was you know, at a lower value in terms of um, the amount of property taxes that it contributed to the city. Well now, that building has come down, they are building multifamily housing, and the property value has increased significantly. Right? That increase in the tax between that kind of base lower value to the new higher value is the increment right, the tax increment that then gets put back into the project for whatever it was, so for in this example, it would have been for the affordable units in that building, right? Um, for certain businesses, it might be, if we do a tax increment financing for economic development, it might be to go toward um, certain parts that would be hard to, hard to do. It's so, it kind of varies. But, um, so we've used TIF for not only affordable housing, but also to bring businesses to Bloomington. And so I just, I wanted to say that because I think sometimes people think that when we offer TIF uh, to developers, that it's property tax dollars take, taken out of our general fund and put into a project. And that is not the case, right? It is the new taxes generated from that project, that land itself, that goes back into the project for a certain amount of time. Once that time lapses, that, that new value goes into our general fund. So I hope I explained it okay. And uh, the TIF funding for this particular project is really going to help make sure the roads are set up, make sure the infrastructure, so plumbing and running all the pipes to the ground, so, and parking. So that's really where the TIF financing is going to help with this project. And so um, really looking forward to it. And when I think about our strategic plan, right, we think about the mission. Our mission is to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community. This makes us remarkable. It's a way for us to showcase to the region, to the state, to other states of the nation that we have things here where people want to be. And when I was on that core planning team, we spent a lot of time making sure that the language and that statement applied to a broad spectrum. It wasn't just residents who want to be here. It's not just businesses who want to be here. It's not just visitors who want to be here. It's people who want to be here. And so this helps us make Bloomington remarkable so that people and businesses want to be here and we can showcase that we are the community that they're looking for and that they know. Uh, the one thing I would mention related to the water park is that um, when the city does approve TIF resources, those resources typically go for public infrastructure to support the project. It's not, you know, like that's, that's usually what TIF is used for. Um, and the nice thing is, is when you do use TIF and you negotiate with developers, you can ask for certain things. And one of the things that we've pushed triple five on pretty hard is making sure that there are really strong sustainability components built into this project. I know that that's a huge concern uh, for myself and for others on the council and for people in the community. And so I just wanted to emphasize that too. 
It's a fun picture. It does look fun, you got to admit. <clears throat> I know my kids would love it. Oh, the other thing to mention about the water park is um, something that we were also very vocal about on council is making sure that Bloomington residents get a discount. <laughs> so I was very happy to see that that went through. All right, so uh, and the next update is around uh, Europolis' expansion. So who here has eaten at Europolis? Yes, everybody. Like, it is a beloved, iconic, locally owned business in Bloomington uh, that we love. And so Europolis, is, we are very excited to say, is about to triple in size. They are about to uh, at, do a 2,400 square foot addition that will include expanded indoor seating as well as outdoor seating. So a fun patio, which I live in this neighborhood, so I could not be more thrilled, let me tell you. In addition, the gas station that everybody in Bloomington loves to hate um, on the corner is getting torn down. And so the construction of this, or this construction will happen uh, through, probably start in the spring, summer 2023 and go through 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and just wanna you know, recognize and appreciate Dino and his team, their commitment to Bloomington. Uh, you know, it's their successful business operation that put them in a position to be able to partner with the city. And we were happy to support them in creating a TIF district happy to um, partner with them on a deed grant. And then also um, we looked at sewer availability charges that really helped them to be able to do that outdoor patio, which of course is just even more appealing for all of us to wanna go there. I will say I've also pretty much begged Dino in the council meeting to expand their hours because I don't know about any of you, but on Sunday afternoons, I'm always like, oh, I wish I could go. Um, so we really are treating this project as an example of how the city can partner with local businesses and use the resources that we have at our disposal to really support them in a much more effective and an enhanced way. Uh, and we are gonna continue to do that work. We're going to accelerate that work. This council is very, very, very committed to supporting small businesses in Bloomington. We are about to launch a small business development center. And then we also, um, just uh, kind of redid the, uh, I'm gonna paint this very simply. So our, we have an HRA, a Housing and Redevelopment Authority, and we have a Port Authority, and we recently kind of restructured so that the Port Authority is taking a much stronger approach on econo economic development throughout the city. Uh, before this change, I think city staff would agree that there really wasn't uh, any specific entity that was like really laser focused on economic de development throughout Bloomington. and so. We're really excited about this change and we believe that it's just gonna significantly accelerate the work that we're doing, especially as it relates to supporting small businesses. And this is a project that I'm really excited about that I don't think is getting enough headlines. So we're getting an Oxendale's grocery store here on the east side on the south loop yes very excited about it i love oxendales i've been to a couple in st paul and it's just like the the nicest greatest local grocery store you could go to so i'm very excited for that but what i'm even more excited for is if you didn't know bloomington has one food desert in our city and the usda defines a food desert as a half mile radius where access to fresh affordable food can be found and in that area just east of the mall into bloomington central station there is no grocery store that's close by that anyone who lives there can go to easily to get fresh produce to make dinner at home. So I'm extremely excited that Oxendale's part of the Carbon 31 development is gonna be here. There's gonna be a grocery store, there's gonna be a liquor store there, and it's gonna help support this area that has been talking and screaming at us for years to help support them in this area. And so by having this here, I'm so excited. We're able to eliminate a food desert and meet the needs of our residents. And that's an incredible story that we got to share more. And so very happy that this is happening. All right, so um, I am very, very proud of the work that the city council has been doing over the past couple of years, but I am like probably the most proud of the work that we've been doing around housing. And uh, you probably hear us talk about it as affordable housing. And unfortunately, the word affordable has negative connotations associated with it. But I really just wanna emphasize that when we talk about affordable housing, this is housing that people across the income spectrum can afford. And uh, the other thing that I wanna say about this is that the area median income in Bloomington for a family of four is $118,000. Yeah, I saw a jaw drop back there. Yes, so when we approve affordable, so first of all, the city does not build affordable housing. So let's just say that. We do not build affordable housing. 
developers approach the city and they ask us to help support them in developing affordable housing using the tools that we have at our, at our disposal, which oftentimes is TIF. But a couple years ago, we also passed an opportunity housing ordinance that allows for some flexibility in developments to decrease their costs and be able to do things like affordable units. Um, so a lot of the units that we have approved are at 60% area median income. So that's like right around $70,000. So I don't know about you all, but when I think about somebody having, a family of four having an income of $70,000, like, I mean, that's not low income, right? And so I just want to kind of challenge the notion that, probably the narrative that, you know, the city is building a bunch of affordable housing and, you know, it's not good, but it really is good for our community because these are places that people who are working in hospitality can live. These are places that first year teachers can live. These are places that first year police officers can live. We have to make sure that we have housing options for people across the income spectrum. And I will also add that we haven't done nearly enough to support people who are below 60%. People who are living, single people who are living on fixed income, right? Seniors who are living on fixed income. Uh, people who are bringing in 30 to $40,000 a year. I think in Council Member D'Alessandro's town hall, she talked about what the minimum wage is, and if you worked full time on minimum wage, it's still only 30, $30,000 a year. So right now we have very little housing opportunities for people who make $30,000 a year, if we expect them to only spend 30% of their income on housing. Um, so go to the next slide here. Uh, one last thing that I will emphasize about this is that uh, Every 10 years, the Met Council sets affordable housing goals for every community. They are very ambitious. Most communities don't ever reach them, but I am proud to say in Bloomington, we recently found out that we are 86% of the way toward our 2030 goals. Uh, that means that we are leading the way across the metro. We are very, very proud of that. Our expectation though is also that other communities are doing their part to also reach their goals and, and uh, help solve this crisis that we're in across the state and country around having enough housing for people. The one thing I'll say about this too is that um, right now we're about 160,000 units short to actually meet the housing demand in the state. Uh, and this is why, you know, if you just supply and demand, housing prices, rent prices continue to go up. And so we have to, as a community, as a state, continue to build so that we can meet that demand. And now, earn sick and safely. Earn sick and safe leave. You probably heard a lot about this uh, late last summer or early last summer, uh, when the city council unanimously voted to approve a uh, sick earn sick and safe leave ordinance for the city of Bloomington. And this is going to take effect starting July 1st of this year. And so the conversation starting again: what's going to happen? What, what are the policies? And essentially, what this ordinance is going to do is allow workers who work in Bloomington to access, earn sick and safe leave time to take care of themselves, their loved ones, um, their family members in an event of uh, a health emergency. And that's a fantastic opportunity so people don't have to choose between I'm gonna lose a day's worth of wages or I'm gonna come in sick and get everyone sick. And as we've seen through this pandemic, that has become the forefront of the conversation of how do we keep our workers safe so we can continue to function, and how can we provide them access and not have fear of losing out on uh, choosing between paying the bills uh, or, or being sick and not functioning properly. So I'm extremely excited for this to come through. Uh, we're gonna be releasing additional information and continue to work with local businesses so that they understand what's coming and what the ordinance and regulations are gonna be. Uh, and so as we continue to do that, we'll be uh, releasing additional information. You can reach out and uh, ask us and we'll be able to provide that for you. All right, another hot topic. Um, rethinking curbside cleanup. So in 2021, the city council approved a new plan for handling bulky waste items in a more sustainable way with our goal really to be seeing more reuse and recycling. In 2018, the city council directed staff to study the environmental impacts of the curbside cleanup program. And during the 2019 cleanup, they audited 2,000 cleanup pile, piles right before they were picked up. So after pickers had gone through them, just wanna emphasize that. 
and about 35% of the materials could have been reused or recycled. Instead, they went to the landfill. Uh, in 2020, curbside cleanup generated 2,000 tons of garbage, all of, which, all of which went to the landfill. So that is equal to 167 city of Bloomington snowplows, all into the dump. Uh, and we know that landfills create uh, methane gas, which is actually 84 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than even carbon. Uh, also, we know that uh, the city of Burnsville has approved the expansion of the Burnsville landfill. The city of Bloomington has written numerous letters of opposition, uh, kind of calling it Mount Garbage at this point. I mean, the fact of the matter is we have to figure out as a community, as a region, as a state, how to stop producing so much garbage, right? There's only so many places that we can take it. Uh, we are fortunate some of ours goes to the incinerator in Minneapolis, but again, like we have to do things to reduce the amount of garbage that we're putting in landfills. Uh, so the updated program elements include, uh, we will have a curbside cleanup event, but it will be on the even years. So in 2023, we will not have a curbside cleanup. In 2024, we will. We will have monthly pickup of reusable and recyclable bulky items for customers that are using city garbage and recycling. So if you have something that needs to be picked up, you can just call the city and have that done. We will have an annual drop-off event in the fall for recyclable materials, such as appliances, scrap metal, material, or mattresses, bicycles, and then also um, paper for on-site paper shredding, and this will be open to all residents. And then we will also have swap events in the summer for, for items like sports equipment or gardening tools. And again, this is open to all residents. Uh, and then a few important things for you all to know, for residents to know, that when we made this change, the, the fee that you will see on your bill now is a bulky item management fee that is replacing curbside cleanup fee and there's actually a 16% decrease in what that cost will be to you. Um, so we, we approved the, that decrease just with the changes of the program. And then you will receive a bulky item management guide within the next couple of weeks in your, in, your mailbox, uh, just to give more further details about these different programs. And then you will also receive a solid waste services guide, which will kind of lay out all of the, the garbage services. So garbage, recycling, organics, recycling, yard waste, bulky items, hazardous waste, and that should be coming in April. And now we're coming up to that time of year where everyone's gonna get this big letter in your mailbox and you're gonna be like, what is this? Uh, I know as a resident myself, it's hard to figure out what's going on with this valuation notice. And so the city has actually created a wonderful video that helps us walk through what this is, what it means. Uh, I think we're gonna show it, um, correct, right? So we're gonna uh, take a second and show this video so that uh, we can see what it, what it means and how you can um, understand it. And if you have questions, we'll... Uh Hi, I'm Deputy Finance Officer Kari Carlson. And I'm City Assessor Tim Bolger. We are going to walk through two documents that will be arriving in mailboxes in March related to taxes and home valuations. I'll talk about the 2023 property tax statement and Tim will discuss the valuation notice. Every year, the county, city, and school district levy a total property tax dollar amount that is necessary to fund services. At the bottom of the 2023 property tax statement, there is a breakout of tax amount showing the portions that go to Hennepin County, the City of Bloomington, and the Bloomington School District. Each of these separate entities receives approximately a third of the total taxes. The City's 2023 property tax levy was set at $74.5 million, which was a 9.15% increase over 2022. I'm going to spend a little more time sharing you through what's different this year. Keeping a city running takes a lot of work and resources. Each year, department budgets and services are carefully studied to make sure services are meeting residents' needs and making progress on the community's mission to make Bloomington an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. To better understand residents' needs, last year, staff engaged with the public about the budget at seven different community events to learn more about what was important to residents when it came to the budget and city services. Along with that, the mayor and council discussed the budget with the community at five town hall forums last fall, as well as detailed discussions at several council meetings throughout the year. The results of the annual national community survey are also analyzed for budget topics. We heard from the community that public safety was a priority. 
and the City Council made sure that was the top priority in the 2023 budget. 85% of the tax levy increase is an investment in police and fire services that includes new full-time police and fire positions, equipment, training, and funds for new fire station construction. For every dollar of city taxes paid, 50 cents go toward police and fire, 25 cents go toward public works, 16 cents goes to community development, community services, and parks and recreation, and the remaining nine cents goes to paying outstanding debt for roads reconstruction and building construction, such as the new fire station number four. The city's total proposed levy amount is spread out among properties based on their value and type of property. Minnesota property tax calculations are very complex, but basically properties that have higher values pay a higher portion of the tax levy. The 2023 tax statements are based on the property valuations that you received last year in March 2022. The 2024 budget process is just getting started. City staff will once again be out in the community this spring and summer gathering input from the public and bringing forward information and options to the City Council. Your property taxes in 2024 will be based on the 2023 property valuation notice, which Tim will walk you through now. Thanks, Kari. In addition to the 2023 property tax statements that Kari explained, 2023 property valuation notices are also mailed out in March. As Kari said, these will be used to determine your 2024 property taxes, but the time to question or appeal your classification or value is upon a receipt of that notice. The valuation notice will show your estimated market value, which is the value used to determine the amount of property taxes you will pay. The estimated market value of your property is determined by the city's assessing division and is based on the market conditions leading up to the assessment date of January 2nd each year. Our assessing division is responsible for accurately assessing 32,000 parcels of real estate in the city and determining their estimated market value, which is the most probable sale price if it were to be sold on the open market. If you believe that the property information on your valuation notice is not correct or believe the value to be inaccurate, you may appeal. Please call our office at 952-563-8722 to discuss your concerns with an assessor. If an inspection is needed, we can schedule an appointment with you. Although most concerns can be resolved by contacting our assessing division, there is also an option to appeal by attending the local Board of Appeal and Equalization. This meeting will be held in the City of Bloomington Council Chambers on Wednesday, April 19th at 6 p.m. The local Board of Appeal and Equalization is an appointed panel of Bloomington residents who are knowledgeable in real estate. They provide a fair and objective forum for property owners to appeal the valuation or classification of their properties. If after attending the local meeting, you are still not satisfied with the results, you can attend the Hennepin County Board of Appeal and Equalization. This will be held on Monday, June 12th at the Hennepin County Government Center in Minneapolis. They recommend that you call by May 17th to make an appointment for the meeting. By the way, these dates are also on the city's website. Remember, it's always best practice to contact the Bloomington Assessing Division first and as soon as you receive your valuation notice. Many concerns can be resolved informally by speaking with our team. Additionally, the state offers income-based property tax refunds for both homeowners and renters. There's also a non-income-based property tax refund available for properties where there has been a large increase in taxes year over year. That state refund form is called the M1PR and can be found on the Minnesota Department of Revenue's website. If you have any questions about your valuation notice or questions about the state's property tax refund program, please contact the city's assessing division at 952-563-8722 or assessing at bloomingtonmn.gov and we'd be happy to help you. Thanks for watching. We're always trying to improve the ways we engage and communicate. If you have suggestions for how we can do better at getting resident input and sharing information, please don't hesitate to contact us with your ideas. All right. Um, if you haven't had any experience with our assessor's office, um, I would recommend if you have any questions to reach out to them. I have previously. Uh, and they are a fantastic group of people who really want to make sure that uh, we're, we're having the right discussions and we're coming to an agreement. And so, uh, as Tim said in the video, most of these um, issues or, or discrepancies or whatever you, you see on your statement uh, can be dealt with informally. And it saves you time because you don't have to go to a bunch of board meetings. And then it saves our assessors time because they're able to directly work with you and figure out uh, how can we, we, we move forward together. So. Uh, any questions on the assessor notice or the valuation notice that comes this, this month, um, please feel free to reach out um, to the assessor's office or to, or to us, uh, and we'll get you in, uh, in contact with the right people to, uh, to discuss the matters. All right? I also just want to say uh, that, I mean, I don't know if you all have noticed, but the way that we develop the budget and approve the tax levy 
has improved so much. And I just want to thank Kari and her team because when I started on council, I mean, you had to go onto the city website and down, like open the budget book, <laughs> which if you printed it is about this thick. I mean, it is a massive document, super helpful, but the community engagement component of setting the budget really had not been developed out. And so we felt passionately as a council that we needed to have a lot more easily accessible resources for our community to understand the budget, understand the tax levy setting process. Uh, that's why Kari has been out in the community, her team has been out in the community listening to residents about what their priorities are. And so uh, just wanna recognize and appreciate that transformation that has happened. And if you ever have any questions related to the budget, uh, we are happy to answer those. So we will move on to questions. And I do think we have a pretty hard stop at 1030. I think uh, Creekside, or 11.30, my apologies. Um, I think Creekside is uh, good at booking their rooms up, and so we want to be respectful of that time. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So the first, first one here is about pedestrian and biker safety, poorly designed intersections, blocked and or obstructed sight lines, speeding slash running stoplights, not stopping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, I'm not sure who asked the question, but I should. Thank you. I should have guessed. I should have guessed. Um, I just want to say that I really appreciate the question, and I agree with your concerns, and I think that others on council also agree. So we actually, uh, our public work staff and our planning staff are just about, they're starting literally, I think, next week, um, an engagement process to look at our active transportation plan, and then also our traffic management program at the same time. So two different things, but address the concerns that you are talking about specifically. Um, I think each one of us on council have talked about our concerns related to obstructed sidewalks, icy sidewalks, people speeding through our neighborhoods at way too high of speeds. I mean, I live in a neighborhood without sidewalks and my kids bike in the street, right? And it makes me really nervous. And so uh, agree and there are there is community engagement and planning happening right now. So we'd love to engage you in that process if you would be willing. Can I just say something? I want to thank uh, the new police chief. In my six years of retirement and riding my bike daily, I have now seen six uh, traffic stops along Old Shockby Road in the previous administration. I only saw one. So I want to thank the new police chief Hodges. It seems like the police force is starting to crack down on people's speed. I appreciate that. Um, so just to, for people who might be viewing this on YouTube, there was a compliment to uh, Chief Hodges on um, uh, his leadership because there is noticing that people are being stopped speeding and it's appreciated. And I think um, just to add, the, one of the other concerns that we want to make sure we're addressing is that we want to make sure that Bloomington's connected. So that means slower speeds, that means having bike lanes, that means having walkable, accessible opportunities for people to walk and explore the community and not just be stuck in your building. So uh, that is also part of the, the conversation that we'll be having moving forward. Not only address the safety concerns, but also how can we continue to build and connect the community together. Well, hello, oh, there it is. Okay. All right, what is the status of the RFP process for 700 American Boulevard West? 700 American Boulevard West. I might have to throw a lifeline. Sorry, Lindale and American? Still working on it. Still working on it. Whoever asked that question, uh, I would encourage you maybe to corner Jamie after the meeting to get details. I had to think about the map in my head. Yes. <clears throat> this question is, Jenna, what have you done to promote small business in Bloomington? How does the family leave thing help? How does the family leave thing help? Great. Um, well, f so I will say um, for very small businesses, uh, the earn sick and safe time applies to businesses that have employees of six or more. So the really small businesses can choose to um, provide people paid time off or I mean, they don't, they don't have to participate in that program. 
Um, so in terms of things that I specifically have done to support small businesses, I mean, I think the launch of the Small Business Development Center is a really great example. Um, you know, it is, believe it or not, a very innovative thing that we're doing in Bloomington. And that idea actually came out of the racial equity strategic planning that we did uh, shortly after we declared racism a public health crisis. Um, and just kind of saw the turmoil that was happening in Minnesota due to the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd. And so the strategic planning team elevated that issue as an idea. And I'm proud to say that I was one of the council members that really advocated for that to move forward. And I'm on the Port Authority, and so advocated through the Port Authority that we move that project forward. Uh, I also will say during the pandemic, uh, city staff, I mean, we made it very clear as a council that we had to do every single thing in our power to support small businesses in Bloomington. And so we worked really closely with Hennepin County to make sure our small businesses were getting the resources that were available to them. City staff were calling businesses individually, making sure that they knew of the support that we could provide. There were a lot of um, forgivable loans that were given out to small businesses. And um, so yeah, so there's a couple of examples kind of off the top of my head. Uh, just in the interest of time, I won't kind of go into more examples, but I'm happy to talk further with whoever asked that question. What is your opinion on a citywide speed limit of 20 miles per hour? And specifically, many streets have no sidewalks and are near schools. A 20 mile per hour on these streets would be great. Yeah, um, I was recently, just a couple weeks ago, out at Olson Elementary School. And if you've ever been in 102nd Street there, and you've been there at uh, drop off or pick up, you can see how fast cars are going. You can see how many kids are walking around, and it is a valid concern. Uh, and that's part of what we just spoke about, and reevaluating what the speed limits are in the city, how can we make our streets safer, uh, and how we can continue to connect the Bloomington to each other. So I truly believe that we need to take a, a broader approach to this. It's been something that's coming for a long time. We've seen other cities have a mandatory citywide speed limit. And so as we start these conversations and really start working and digging towards this, we'll definitely be um, reaching out for com community engagement to make sure that we're treading the right direction and putting in policies that make sense to protect our kids, to protect our residents, and protect the people who are out and enjoying our city. So um, very much looking forward to the work that we're gonna be doing coming up here uh, to address uh, speed and safety concerns. And I would say that I absolutely support um, reducing speed limits next to schools, very, very important. Uh, I think the first part of that question was a city-wide speed limit of 20 miles an hour, which I think um, would not only be, I think that would pretty much be impossible uh, because the city does not, I mean, the county has roads. The infrastructure is pretty complex, but on our local streets, we have a lot more authority and, and things that we can do. And so um, just kind of want to put that out there that we couldn't do a 20 mile per hour speed limit throughout the whole city, but there are definitely places that we should be reducing speeds, I believe. How to politely correct really bad info on next door. <laughs> um, whoever can answer I, that I, question I, gets the Nobel I, Peace I, Prize I, at this point. I hate to engage in constant fact checking. That's a great question. That's a great question. I mean, and also on Facebook and Twitter. And yep. I mean, I think that that's a problem that we have in society right now is the rapid spread of misinformation and the damage that can be done very quickly. And so, I mean, we try our best in the city to have proactive communications. If you check out YouTube and social media, we have a lot of videos that highlight a lot of the good work that's been happening. We also very intentionally, you know, develop communications on some of the contentious issues. We very intentionally included things like the water park and the expo and curbside today so that we can talk about it and have conversations. Um, but I would encourage people, you know, if you have if you see things, just reach out to the city. I mean, we're not, we're not hiding things. And we want to hear honest opinions from residents. And so um, please know that sometimes on Facebook I, or on any next door, I don't think things always start out as intentionally misleading or misinformation. But it's almost like the game of telephone that we used to play when we were little, right? Like you tell one person, and then the next person tells the next person. But it kind of changes. The story changes a little bit. And I think that, I mean, I see that happening too, right? Where what, what is actual fact kind of then gets turned into 
not so fat. So. And just personally, over the last few weeks, a uh, couple months, if I get sent an email, I'm putting in the actual link to the actual proposal to you so that you know what's going on. Um, like Jenna said, we, we have nothing to hide. We're residents here too, and so we want to continue to see uh, Bloomington be successful. And so uh, if you have questions, reach out. Our city staff is fantastic in answering questions directly, uh, or reach out to your council members and we'll work to get that uh, information to you as well so that you have it from the source of what's actually going on instead of relying on the 10th person who talked to this person and that person, now it's finally getting to you. So um, please reach out anytime you have questions. Comments about World Expo? I'm dubious. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so whoever asked that question, do you want to give any other specific questions that we did not address in the presentation that you would want to ask? Otherwise, I think we just, I feel like we spoke yeah. quite a bit about it. I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand. During okay. the March 20th City Council meeting, will there be a public hearing about the City Code Amendment? single and two family residential standards and comprehensive plan text amendment or will citizens not be allowed to speak to it yes. follow up oh. one quick second here follow up if it is not a public hearing how do we best reach out for concerns it is a public hearing uh, we had a public hearing the last time we talked about it at a council meeting we closed it and then we decided to open up a public we didn't have to do another public hearing but we decided to open it up again uh, because we know that there are people who want to engage in the discussion. And so we will have a public hearing. We encourage everybody to come out and learn more at the council meeting and then also express your opinion. In the meantime, please reach out to city council members, city staff, to just make sure you have accurate information. I will honestly say I have no idea how I'm going to vote on that specific ordinance. And like I want to hear from residents. And I think it's really important that people have facts about what we're actually doing. The city is not proposing, you know, buying up properties and building quadplexes and apartment buildings and neighborhoods, right? Like that's ridiculous. We're not, that is not the proposal. So just please make sure you're reaching out to get uh, the facts of the situation. Again, no idea how I'm gonna vote personally, but, um, but really wanna make sure that we're getting good resident feedback based on accurate information. And I'll add to that, this is a necessary conversation for us to have. Um, so uh, we've, the interactions we've had with residents so far have been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, we want the residents are actively engaging with us to make sure that we're understanding where their thoughts and their opinions are. But Bloomington is a built out city, if you haven't noticed. We don't have land like Plymouth or Lakeville where you can just like put up a bunch of houses or redevelop and put up a new mall. We just don't have that space or that capacity to do that. And so it's a necessary conversation for us to have so that we can best chart together with you the, the, what Bloomington is going to look like and how we can support people who want to be here so they can live here, they can work here, they can raise their children here. Uh, so it's a great conversation for us to have. It's not easy by any means, uh, but we'll continue to have that conversation and continue to have your input so that we can make the best decision for the future of Bloomington uh, and what uh, Bloomington is going to be ultimately uh, as we look forward. Can you please address proposed residential rezoning? How will you protect homeowners, neighborhoods from, from over-urbanization, congestion, pollution, property values, et cetera? So again, I think it's a similar question to the last one. Um, I will also just emphasize that if the council were to, pro to move to approve this ordinance, it is very much, uh, it would impact a very small amount of parcels across the city and it is, the council wouldn't be doing anything, right? Like, if people decide to sell their large lots and, and they sell it to somebody who then is, wants to split it, that person would, could do that if the lot was big enough, if, right? Again, this would only apply to a very small percentage of lots in Bloomington. And so um, I just, again, just kind of want to emphasize that. I know we spoke to it in the last. Yeah, and for me, the stance I'm seeing on it is it's a reduction in government regulation. If you're a property owner, I firmly believe you should have the right to do what you want with your property. And the government should not be pushing uh, as many regulations as they can on you on what you can and cannot do with your property. And I'm also a proponent of free market. So if this does get passed, it's up to the property owner, like Jenny said, to decide what they want to do. And then it's ultimately up to the free market to decide 
is this valuable enough for us to split this and put two homes instead of one home on here? And so there's a lot of different factors that go into this. It's not an easy decision by any means. Um, I have my concerns regarding it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have a couple of weeks to continue to have these conversations with staff, with residents. And so we'll continue to have this conversation. And we're very thankful that you continue to engage with us in a positive way so that we can really make the right decision. And I also will just emphasize too that, again, um, we're not, the current R1 zoning district is for single and two family homes. We're not changing that. It's still for single and two family homes. Uh, the thing that is changing is, well, I have talking points here, but it's like lot size requirements and setbacks from the front of the road. And so it's, again, it, when you actually look at how many parcels would be eligible to be split and then have a single or two family home built, it's a pretty small portion of yeah. the properties. And that's not even like putting into account like topography, right? Like some of these might be on uh, Overlook and if you've ever been over there, they kind of drop off pretty fast. So like even though you might qualify, there are other factors that could come in that won't allow that anyway. So uh, lots of things again to consider. Um, so you can email, we just have a city council address that you can send one email and it'll go to all of us and then we can respond individually. Yep. But really if you want to talk to all of us at the same time, it has to be during the public hearing. Yep. Otherwise we would be in violation of open meeting law. And, yeah. Yeah. But I, I know lots of different council members, myself included, have had individual conversations with uh, individual residents based on their concerns. And so like, we are not like, up against like, no, we're not gonna have coffee with you and chat about it. So send us an email and we'll continue the conversation and keep talking. So um, that's something, something as a new council member that I've been really um, happy and excited about is just the actual conversations that are happening uh, between council members and residents when we are uh, out and part of this community. So um, please don't feel like you can't reach out to us. And I will also say that it's through resident conversations that so many really good questions and very valid points have been brought up, right? Things that we may not be thinking about. And, and so when we hear from residents and we hear the good questions and you know, concerns, then we know to ask those questions in the council meetings. And so it's super helpful. I mean, I really, please reach out, please email, please call. So. This is, uh two pieces on this card. Um, one you've probably addressed um, pretty significantly already, but I'm gonna read it. 160 houses short, what is being done to meet the needs of family housing, that's underlined, and in parentheses, three to four bedroom housing, affordability two. Yep, so that's part of this single and two family, uh, the zoning changes is to at least have a couple more opportunities for new houses to be built in Bloomington. Uh, we also recently made some changes to our accessory dwelling unit policy. And so people can actually build accessory dwelling units on their property now. So let's say you have like a multi-generational housing situation. You want uh, your mother-in-law to live in an accessory unit on your property, or you would like I think some, I think we can do. I think you can have you can rent it out. I Maybe mean, I shouldn't say that. I don't really know. I'm blanking. But um, so uh, the other thing is that the Housing and Redevelopment Authority uh, is really foca focusing strongly on kind of the housing continuum and has a kind of revived focus on increasing access to home ownership. And that work is just kind of getting off of the ground. Uh, Eric uh, Coleman is our HRA administrator and really leading that, but there's a lot of really cool work that's underway. Um, for example, the Met Council just released some properties that they had bought from the city many, many, many years ago uh, in the um, scenario that 35 would be expanded. Not going to happen, and so they gave, those, they gave those properties back to the city. Uh, we are now talking with some different developers to build some uh, homes on those properties, and they would be affordable options for people. So those are just some examples. Second piece, although the World Expo sounds like an exciting opportunity, have unintended consequences of such large events been addressed? Some of these are increase in human trafficking, increase influx of drugs and crime, 
What will be done to keep the residents of Bloomington and the metro area uh, from the impact of these unintended consequences? And then there's an asterisk. Human trafficking is increasing and our students statewide are being recruited. Contact actunited.org for ver verification. Well, thank you for that question. All very valid concerns um, that we have. We, we don't want anyone to fall into something like human trafficking. And I think the benefit of having state and federal support with this is we will have resources that are beyond what our police force can do. Right? Our police force is focused here on Bloomington to address the needs of Bloomington, and adding this on top of it is another you know, lift that we're asking them to do. So having the support from the state and the federal level gives us the resources to reduce the work that our personal, our own police department has to do and gives them insight into how we can address this from the state, uh, address this from the federal level to reduce that and make sure that if this event does come to Bloomington, it is successful because we're promoting healthy people, healthy planet, uh, that's part of it. And so uh, having those resources, I think is gonna be something that will be invaluable to us that we'll be able to continue to use moving forward. And I will say, we, we do have experience doing this already. So for example, when the Super Bowl was here, a lot of the Super Bowl activities were actually in Bloomington. And so we have experience working with state and federal authorities on increased security. Um, and so we have, yeah, we have that experience. We have kind of some of the models in place. And so we will continue to work very, very closely with those partners and make sure that we have the resources in place to ensure the security of Bloomington. My understanding that RS-1 lots are not subject to the proposed city residential code changes, so I assume planning looks at all R1 lots the same. They are not. Was there any considerations that all R1 lots and areas are not the same, especially when considering safety, wildlife quarters, wetlands, and topography? Question mark. And finally, do you both agree with the assumption that all R1 lots should be considered the same in the proposed code changes? Uh, so I think this is a great question. And if you actually watch the council meeting, I asked a very similar question. Um, so I look forward to staff answering that at our council meeting because I agree. Like, I, I think we have, the point that I made is that we have a couple of residential zones and then we have a lot of different other zones, right? For commercial, industrial, and it, I do think that there is opportunity for us to be a little more um, adaptive, I guess, in our, or not adaptive. Um, I don't think they're homogenous, right? I don't think R1 <coughs> lots are all the same. And so I do think there is an opportunity for us there, and, but we'll continue the conversation. Yeah, and the analogy I was using is a broad brush approach or a fine brush approach. And so I think there's opportunity for us to really evaluate what a broad sweeping, broad brush uh, proposal like this means, or to have the consideration to have, okay, how can we better uh, serve the city by having a finer approach? And so those are all questions that uh, have been asked and we will continue to get answers to so that we can make the right decision for that. It appears that participation in the organic waste pickup program is not being utilized by very many residences. Realizing that, is ma that it is mandated by Hennepin County, but the way it is done is up to the municipality. Why not do it like Ramsey County, where it is picked up by the same truck as recycling? There are so many trucks rumbling around on pickup day, burning fuel and wear and tear on the streets. It's almost like it was before when competing trash companies were hired by the resident and lots of different trucks roared through the neighborhoods. So maybe it's time to take another look at what the city approved. All valid points. Uh, I, I, this brings me back to, I don't know, when I was a kid, I remember like recycling being brought up and having a recycling bin instead of just a, a garbage bin. And the same thing happened. It takes time to get adoption for people to understand how do we use this. Uh, and then it takes time for the city to figure out what's the best way to do it and uh, make it more efficient. So very valid, I think, conversations we'll continue to have as we address how do we make this uh, more accessible to people, how to make it easier for people to use, and ultimately, how do we keep our streets safe uh, so that people understand how to use them properly. Uh, so yes, continued conversations to improve this process. I also just really appreciate the suggestion to look at Ramsey County's model, because yes. I think that's a great idea. What are the plans for the two-acre empty lot at 86th and Penn? 
Um, so these are the townhomes. This is the Penn Lake townhomes that uh, have been under discussion. I think this is probably one of the first votes that I took on council in 2020. Uh, so if you recall, ultimately the city had voted, uh, had voted no to not have the development move forward. Uh, there was litigation and unfortunately the city did not win and so the developer is moving forward with townhomes. Is that okay, Jamie? Okay, so we don't have an active proposal right now. Okay, but yes. Why aren't smaller electric buses used around town instead of the big, mostly empty gas guzzlers? Um, so the city does not run the bus system. The Met Council does, Met Transit. Uh, however, I will say that starting in 2002, Met Transit did start transitioning to electric buses, and I think just within the last couple of years, they have a zero emissions plan. They've created a zero emissions plan that they are beginning to operationalize, and so I agree that it's super concerning. We know that uh, transportation is one of the biggest contributors to um, you know, climate change, the transportation sector, and so we know it's really important. Um, we are very supportive of Met Council's efforts to transition to electric buses, and so very valid concern and point. Yep. And as we look at how to best meet the needs of our residents and transportation, we continue to have those conversations with Met Transit. Uh, and also, we have our strategic priorities, and baked into that is environmental sustainability, and so we wanna make sure our strategic priorities um, are going to be met by our partners as well. So uh, those are conversations we're gonna continue to have and make sure that we're hitting strategic priorities and making sure that residents who need transportation are gonna be taken care of. And so at the moment, uh, it is what we have set up now, but we're gonna be looking forward to how we can improve that. I thought that the receipt of the SAFER grant in the amount of 527K would help reduce the levy because it would cover some of the costs of the firefighters. However, that wasn't the case. Then when I listened to the budget presentation, there was a line item called reduction in strategic priority transfer revenue in the amount of 729K. What is that? I asked my council pe person and he said he would call me about it, but never did. Uh, do you wanna talk about the safer grant? <laughs> and then I can talk about strategic priorities as part of the question. Sure, the 527K reduction that the person is referring to actually isn't related to the uh, SAFER grant or the SAFER firefighters. It's related to us starting and reducing the number of additional firefighters we are hiring from six to three and starting them actually um, in July rather than in January. So that 527K uh, savings was based upon starting three firefighters in July rather than January. Is that pretty close, Kari? All right. I got my fact checker here. So. All right. Um, and so then the other piece around the strategic priorities fund. So um, for many, many, many years, long before this version of the city council, the city council has a strategic priorities fund, and that allows the council to work on priorities that may be emergent or maybe kind of one-time expenses. It's really varied, I, I think, over the years. Uh, so when the pandemic hit and we kind of had this perfect storm of the commercial uh, property values tanking, so then the residents experiencing more of the property tax burden, of course things being shut down, loss of revenue, I mean, obviously it was just kind of the perfect storm, right? Uh, the city council knew at that time that even if we passed a 0% levy, property taxpayers of Bloomington were gonna see a huge increase in their property tax bill because of those shifts in the market. And so we had decided to put aside a big chunk of money in that strategic priorities fund um, we called it tax levy stabilization money so that we could use those resources to offset some of that property tax burden that residents were gonna be facing. Uh, the, the challenge with that approach, which we felt very passionately in that moment, um, the it was the right thing to do. The challenge is that it creates a structural imbalance moving forward in our budget. So. Um, so we had planned for several years to be infusing these resources into uh, the property tax conversation, right, the levy conversation to offset some of those property tax increases. Uh, but we have to start doing that less and less over the years. 
because again, it is a structural imbalance in the budget. It's not sustainable. And so um, that is what I think the question was referring to. We had originally planned on doing, I think infusing like 1.8 million into uh, the, the budget and we reduced it down to 1.1 just again to address that structural piece. The Veep Food Pantry in Bloomington is facing a continuing high demand for food in response to inflation and the impending reduction of SNAP benefits as COVID supports are being reduced. The Food Pantry provides food support to families and seniors in Bloomington, Richfield, Edina, and parts of South Minneapolis. The 2021 online annual report for Veep indicates that it provided services to 23,236 people and had 1,785 volunteers. It also shows it received the following donations. City of Edina, 100,000 plus. City of Richfield, 100,000 plus. City of Bloomington, 25,000 to 49,999. Questions. What amount has the City of Bloomington donated to VEEP in 2022? And is there a way that the City of Bloomington can donate more funding to VEEP? With proposals pending for a $345 million on a water park and to spend $35 million on the ice garden, it seems that additional funding to VEEP could be donated by the city to provide for the basic food needs of its families and seniors. Um, so I really appreciate this question. I am a former VEEP board member and I've spent most of my career working in the area of hunger relief and food access and so totally understand the concern here. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, the city has uh, um, given VEEP around $500,000. Uh, and this is in kind of social work uh, support, emergency rent assistance, and I think there was one other bucket. Those are the two primary things. Uh, and we continue to support VEEP. I don't know what our specific 2022 number is. Um, and we can look that up, but uh, agree that it's a huge concern, especially as um, some of the COVID emergency provisions are being rolled back and SNAP benefits are being decreased for family. It's super concerning. These are also conversations that are happening at the state legislature because a lot of the big hunger relief organizations are incredibly concerned about the impact that it's going to have on the hunger relief system and their ability to be able to meet the needs across that system. So. Um, I mean, I would definitely be open to the opportunity of looking for more resources for Veep. Um, Jamie's smiling at me. He's like, of course you would. No. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to add anything else. No, um, you know, I, I just think Veep is a valuable partner that we have here in Bloomington. Um, as the, the, the question, asker, uh, question asker mentioned, like we support a broad regional um, uh, base. And so we will continue to prioritize and make sure that these types of agencies that support the, the city, support the region, are, are being able to function and to help support as much as possible. So um, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, the other thing I will add, and then I'll turn it over to Jamie, is that our public health department does a really great job of working with community organizations like Veep and Oasis and Cornerstone. Um, and, and we have CHWs now that are out working in community, trying to really make sure that people know about the other resources and support that they have available through that to them, whether that be through some government services or making sure that they're on, you know, WIC or getting them on the list for Section 8. Uh, so there are a variety of things that we can do to also help offset just kind of the daily living costs for people. Maybe not us specifically as a city providing those resources, but connecting them to the right resources. I did confirm with the cities of Richfield and Edina the amount of money that they sent to be was also from the federal funds that came from the CARES funding and the ARP, the American Rescue Plan, which is what the city of Bloomington did. So in a normal non-COVID year, uh, Richfield, Edina, and Bloomington are sending about the same amount of money in the to be. That's all the questions. That have Ooh, been good job, everyone. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We got 10 minutes. Are there any <laughs> other questions? Um, not related to my topic, but how did Feed Our Future happen then? If we have all these great organizations in Minnesota that have $250 million, where was our government? Was nobody questioning? Was nobody, you know, I, second hard is hard, and it takes money out of my checking account every month. I, I would rather have seen $250 million go to second hard is hard than or a leave or something. Totally agree. Totally agree. 
I, you know, I personally don't know feeding our, I, again, I've worked in the hunger relief for a long time and I don't know that organization, I didn't know that organization or the people at that organization, to my knowledge. And I know that people in the hunger relief community, people at Second Harvest and Hunger Solutions, Veep, Loaves and Fishes, are really frustrated and angry about that because, you know, it makes the hunger relief system itself look questionable when it shouldn't be. It's a high, it's a system that is, has so many checks and balances in it. And so the fact that this happened, like, I mean, I don't, I don't know a lot about and I can't speak to, um, but I will just say that I think you're not the only one that's frustrated by what happened. What was that? You have ideas what happened, don't you? Not at all. No uh, whispers, no I mean, I used to, I mean, it was just fraud. I have no idea how they did it or what happened, but I mean, I know what I read in the newspaper, just like everybody else. <laughs> This, but so it's just at the federal level that they dropped the ball more than the state or the local. Yeah, I, th I don't think we, we have uh, the, the details for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and my personal feel on it is it's unfortunate that we have a minority of people who act this way. I think one of the big things that I look forward to being on council is creating community. Because I think when we create community, you care for your neighbors, you care for each other, you care for the city. And so when bad actors and things like this happen, the residents, the people who are engaged and involved are the ones that are making sure it doesn't happen. And so by the time it gets to the, the city level where we have to make policy around it, we know what you're thinking. We know that our community is engaged and working together. Uh, and so that's where I, I firmly believe that as we continue to build community and connect residents throughout the city, these types of things are what we're going to be able to have be our secondary and tertiary effects of everything that we're doing. So I'm very excited um, to be here for this and, and very thankful for all of you to come out here today. Um, we didn't know what to expect, whether it's going to be like three people or like a hundred. So thank you so much for being here today. Yes, thank you. Um, and please, as we're getting ready to wrap up here, as you're walking out, put a sticker on your, your district so we can know where you're coming from. and. Um, please continue to engage us. We are the at-large members, and so we want to take that broad Bloomington view, so please let us know uh, so we can go pester your district council member too <laughs> and, get, uh, <laughs> and get your concerns addressed. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you.